Hello, and welcome to Dead to Rights, the podcast. I'm your host, Donna Carrick. Today, I'm happy to bring you a story titled The Case of the Carriageless Horse by Stephen M. Moore. Stephen is a writer of sci-fi thrillers and detective stories, and he often features his two great characters, Chen and Castelblanco, who both appear in this early story from their careers. This story first appeared in the anthology World Enough and Crime, which was brought to you by Carrick Publishing in 2014. So I hope you'll really enjoy this great story by Stephen M. Moore, The Case of the Carriageless Horse. And this particular story starts with an editor's note, so I'll read you that. With his characteristically gripping style, Stephen Moore introduces us to those lovable, intelligent detectives, Chen and Castelblanco, in this tale from their early case files, The Case of the Carriageless Horse. Detective Rolando Castelblanco was no longer a patrolman. He'd graduated to the big leagues. The new detective sat on a bench in Central Park. He loved his city, its diversity, its character, and its green areas surrounded and protected by watchful and silent skyscrapers. He also loved its food and nightlife. Late lunch was a hot dog with spicy mustard and relish, washed down with soda, He noted a drop of mustard on his new tie, knew enough to let it dry instead of smearing it with a napkin. Taking care of multiple uniforms had been bad enough, but new shoes, slacks, sports coats, and tie had set him back to the point that lunch from a street cart was the only option until next paycheck. What had Al Dempsey said about his promotion? You'll be so rich, kid, you'll think you own the city. Yeah, sure. At least maybe his shoes would last longer because he didn't have to walk a beat. He smiled. Al was an institution. He hoped he'd learn a lot from him. He was about to down the last two bites when he spotted the horse. He didn't know too much about horses, but he loved the ones in Central Park. Who wouldn't? Kids? Tourists and romantics loved them, in spite of that classic Seinfeld episode. Add fake gas lights and a bit more cop presence in the park to make nighttime rides safe, and you'd maybe need more horses and carriages to keep up with demand. The city had other charms, but its horse-drawn carriages provided something special, a quixotic clash between old and new. He tossed the remains of his lunch into a trash barrel not far from the bench and sauntered over to match speed with the animal. He grabbed the bridle and halted the horse. Whoa, big fellow, where did you come from? The horse shook its head and whinnied. I speak a few languages, my friend, but not yours. Pashtu was the most recent one he had struggled to learn, but he was sure the horse was not a rabid jihadist. Let's backtrack a bit and see if we can find your carriage and driver. He guided the horse through a U-turn and retraced its route along a straight section and then around a bend skirting a pond to where he saw the carriage, but no driver. Correction, no live driver. The man's body was half immersed underwater from the waist up. What was Al's first rule? Don't touch a damn thing. Second rule? Call CSU and let them come do their damn magic. Castelblanco's first rule, though, was to call Al. He weighed down the horse's reins with a stone and dialed his new partner's phone. No answer. Figures. Still out to lunch. Okay, Al's rules for now. Kid, I leave you alone to do a chore and you find trouble, said Al Dempsey as he and Castelblanco watched CSIs do their magic. Castelblanco knew Dempsey was jerking his chains, but he didn't like being called a kid. 
He might be inexperienced as a homicide detective, but he'd participated in some interesting cases as a patrolman, and overseas military duty must count for something. Is this now our case, he said? Yes and no. Dempsey was always explaining how things worked as if Castelblanco knew nothing about police procedure. He anticipated what was coming. If there are drugs involved, maybe Narcotics Division will take it. If there are sex crimes involved, maybe Vice. If there were tourists kidnapped here, we call the FBI. And maybe if there's cruelty to animals, we'll call PETA in to help us, said Castelblanco with a smile. He popped two tums. Damn spicy mustard. Who would kill this guy and set his horse loose? There's no blood, and there weren't any gunshots. No witnesses, either. My guess is the horse broke free and bolted. You wouldn't have heard the ruckus, because the tree's leaves would filter out that wee bit of sound. We'll see what CSU says. We don't even have an ID yet. His name's Robert Jenkins, said Castelblanco. The horse is Sam. How'd you know that? Says so on his carriage license. Think Jenkins owns Sam? Maybe he owned the horse. Maybe not. It's a strange profession. Why don't you do something useful and have that uniform over there cord on off the area? We're starting to collect rubberneckers, though it's still damn cold. It's spring, Al. The sun's trying to warm us. Leaves are appearing on the trees. When you're my age, anything below 70 feels cold. Detective, Castelblanco looked up from his terminal. A uniformed cop, a slender Asian woman, stood before him, notebook in hand. He had no idea who she was. Should I? he wondered. The pad obscured his view of her name tag. She wore the uniform well, as if a model had decided to put on a police uniform and step out on a fashion runway. Castelblanco remembered how disheveled he had looked in his ill-fitting uniform. He had a hard time making any clothes fit right, even in the Navy. That was one reason basic training had been hell. Training to be a SEAL had been worse, of course, both physically and mentally. Combat hadn't been a picnic either. So, recently out of uniform, he thought the chasm between detectives and uniformed cops wasn't appropriate. He stood and offered his hand. Castelblanco, and your? Officer Daoming Chen, sir. She shifted the notepad to her left hand. Her grip was firm. They told me to collect information about the Vicks family. He smiled and sat again. I already know he was a NAM veteran. What else did you find? He has a sister in Sacramento. California? I'm not familiar with any other Sacramento. There was no smile, but Castelblanco thought it was a good dig. Yeah, where else? Iraq? He smiled for Officer Chen. Anything else, he asked? He lived in Brooklyn. She offered the address. It's an old hotel converted into an apartment building. Al Dempsey returned from the M.E. at that point. Hiya, Chen. Okay, is there anyone in NYPD he doesn't know? You auditioned for Saturday Night Live yet? Pardon, sir? Don't sir me, my Asian beauty, who never smiles at my jokes. Are you flirting with my new partner? No, sir. Then get the hell out of here. Rolly and I need to take care of business. After she left, Dempsey handed Castelblanco a piece of paper with a string of numbers, some numbers with one digit, others with two. What do you make of that? Castelblanco shrugged. You first. I'll give you a hint. They're from a Chinese fortune cookie. Too bad Chen just left. The rookie detective frowned. Dempsey was old school. Political correctness meant voting for the candidate anointed by the union. If I had to guess, I'd say he used those numbers to play the lottery 
and kept the fortune to check them against results. Dempsey thought a few beats. That's as good an idea as any. I guess that wouldn't have anything to do with the murder. I wouldn't discount it. Suppose he played and won, and someone else knew. They'd be looking for the lottery ticket, said Dempsey. He thought some more. Worth checking out. He looked at his watch. You live in Brooklyn. Go visit the Vic's apartment and then go home. Maybe you'll have some luck and find the ticket. Our fund could use an infusion of cash. Castel Blanco frowned again. Geez, Roly, that was a joke. You're as bad as Chen. Castel Blanco smiled. Dempsey's in rare form today, he thought. Do I need a search warrant? The guy's dead, so he won't complain. If the landlord gives you crap, call me. My kid is in a talent show out in New Jersey. If I don't go, my ex might scratch my eyes out. You should want to be there for your kid. Dempsey looked at Castel Blanco as if he were from another planet. Did you hear me say it's a kid's talent show? Castel Blanco convinced the Vic's landlord to let him in. The landlord entered first but stopped cold at the doorway. Castel Blanco peered over his shoulder. The old hotel room had been made into a studio apartment. It was trashed. Pictures that once hung on walls were broken and on the floor. Wallpaper was peeled down to plaster board and studs in some cases. Mattress, chair, cushions, and pillows were ripped open. Their stuffing scattered about, and even the stained and frayed carpeting had been sliced into sections and lifted off the floor. Someone was looking for something, said Castel Blanco. Brilliant deduction, detective. Who's going to pay for all this? Not the Vic's insurance, I'd bet. He probably doesn't have any. Well, I have a huge deductible, said the landlord. I'm going to have to raise rents to cover the repairs. How much does a room like this go for? The landlord told him. Castel Blanco was surprised it was so exorbitant. No rent control here. I passed the intel on to the New York lottery, said Castel Blanco the next morning, while giving Dempsey an update. They'll check to see if they sold a ticket with those numbers and whether it's a winner. Right now, I can't think of anything else to do. CSU says whoever ransacked the apartment must have used booties and rubber gloves. Real pros. I'm going to give the sister in California a toot as soon as it's a decent hour out there, said Dempsey. Why don't you take a look at where that guy kept his horse and carriage? Those drivers spend a lot of time with their steeds. Maybe you'll find something. Yeah, I can imagine, said Castel Blanco, and I have new shoes. Dempsey smiled. Just part of the initiation, kid. Castel Blanco patted the horse. He seemed more at ease in his stable, hanging with the fellows. Well, Sam, I'll bet you know all old Bob Jenkins' secrets, right? The horse snorted. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty ripe in here. In front of the stable there was a storage bin. The lock had been smashed, but he couldn't tell when. Did this just happen, old boy? He could see how people were fond of horses. Sam seemed noble, although Castel Blanco assumed he'd spent his whole life pulling carriages around with tourists in them. He'd probably made many people happy. Maybe he's happy, too, because of that, he thought. Wonder how many marriage proposals you've heard in your long life. The horse looked at the detective with soulful eyes. I bet you miss old Bob. Maybe you'll find another driver. He rummaged around in the bin. It was filled with broken harnesses, tools to repair them, and spare parts for the carriage. But without any tools for that, there was also a thick, heavy book. He pulled it out and dusted it off. The collected works of William Shakespeare, he read. Maybe there's more to old Jenkins than being a lonely old Vietnam veteran. What do you think, Sam? The horse eyed him. He opened the book. The center had been removed and the space was filled by an old pistol. It looked Russian. 
He knew veterans brought souvenirs back from overseas. He had done it, too. He also knew Russian and Chinese arms were used by the Viet Cong. But maybe there was more to the gun's story than just serving as a souvenir. He sniffed at the barrel and smiled. He dropped it in a plastic bag, removed his gloves, and tossed them in a nearby trash can. He patted the horse again. I'll see what I can do about getting you a new driver. I need to do forensic on this weapon. Ciao, old fellow. It's been fired recently, said the technician. There weren't any bullets around? Not one, said Castelblanco, and the M.E. said Jenkins was beaten and strangled. Maybe the gun doesn't have anything to do with this case, said Dempsey. I'm still betting on a lottery ticket. What other motive can there be, he thought. What's all this other stuff in the report, said Castelblanco. GSR, the M.E. said, referring to gunshot residue. Traces of mucus and saliva, too. Maybe the horses? It's not human, said Dempsey. No, definitely not human. Can we test it to make sure it's the horses, said Castelblanco. Don't waste the man's time, said Dempsey with a growl. The Vic was around horses. Whatever he used the gun for, maybe to shoot a stable rat, the horse slobbered over it afterward, right? If you say so, the technician said, with a smile for Dempsey followed by a raised eyebrow for Casto Blanco. We can confirm whether the traces belong to the old man's horse. If they don't, it's anyone's guess. After the technician left, Castelblanco perched on the edge of his desk. He shared it with three other detectives on different shifts, but thought they wouldn't mind if he dusted a bit. Did you talk to the sister? Pretty much estranged. She was against the war, and they never talked after he went over. Their last conversation was a fight about that, in fact. She's filled with remorse now. That damn war almost tore this country apart. I guess it did the same to some families. She understood why he was close to horses, said he always loved animals, wanted to be a veterinarian. Dempsey smoothed what hair he had left back over his balding head. Any luck with the lottery? Those numbers correspond to a minor winner, a million-dollar prize, said Castelblanco, sold in Brooklyn at a convenience store near the Vic's apartment. No one has come forward to claim the prize. Because they haven't found the ticket, said Dempsey. If anyone does come forward, we'll have Jenkins murderer. If not, ticket's still not found. We have to wait. Let's work on some other cases. A week later, Castelblanco was sitting on the same bench, eating pastrami on rye with spicy mustard, this time with hot coffee. A cold breeze was blowing in from the seaport. He had turned up the collar of his sports coat. Some preschool children went by, herded by parents or maybe volunteers and teachers, because some of the adults looked young. He figured the ratio of grown-ups to kids was appropriate for the age of the kids. He could remember that excitement as a kid. They're babbling about their trip to the zoo, he thought. He jumped up, tossed the rest of his sandwich, and dashed off. The zoo's administrative office was open. An office assistant, a gum-chewing young woman, seemed glad to have her lunchtime vigil interrupted. Any security problems here a week or so ago, said Castelblanco. Sure, someone took pot shots at our leopard. We reported it to you guys. You mean NYPD. I'm homicide. Smack, smack. Whatever. The cops never discovered who did it. Is there any way I can inspect that cage? I guess we can set that up if you have a good reason. He did. Now I know you're bonkers, Dempsey said to him two hours later. The snow leopard was locked in his den. Maybe pissed to hell, thought Castelblanco. CSIs were in the outside pen used for public viewing, going over every square inch. A half hour later, one found the lottery ticket in a plastic sandwich baggie, wedged into a crack in a mound of concrete, playing the role of a boulder. 
Shortly thereafter, another found prints on a metal ladder, providing a little-used alternate access to the pen for those who cleaned it. I'll be damned, said Dempsey. You found the lottery ticket and the murderer. Maybe, if the prints aren't those of the zookeeper, and assuming he's the same person who used Jenkins' gun to protect himself from the leopard while he searched the pen, he wouldn't have zookeepers helping him like we do. So, why didn't he find the ticket, said Dempsey. Castel Blanco smiled. Maybe two reasons. He came in at night, but night was ending. Snow leopards hunt at dusk and dawn. Second reason, either he was a bad shot, or he didn't want to shoot the animal, only scare it. In either case, I'm guessing he ran out of bullets for that old gun he was using. Probably dropped it, too. Maybe out of fear. Hence the animal slobbers. Somehow he managed to grab it and run. The prince led to another carriage driver with a record who confessed and confirmed most of Castelblanco's theory. He'd beaten the information out of Jenkins before strangling him. He still had deep scratches on his left arm. He was lucky, Castelblanco said, at least with the leopard. Dempsey nodded. Another case closed. The sister doesn't want the money, he said. She wants to start a foundation for carriage horses and their friends in the zoo. Obviously, Jenkins loved both of them. He also loved the zoo enough to trust it as a bank for safeguarding a deposit of a million dollars, said Castelblanco. Lord knows when he thought to cash it. Man didn't have a bank account as far as we know. Maybe he was going to talk to a lawyer first. The lottery recommends that for big winners. Dempsey eyed his partner, who was reclining in his chair, sipping from his mug, filled with precinct coffee. A donut and a plastic bottle of Tums would soon participate in his snack. Not bad for a rookie's first case. Thanks, Al. That means a lot to me. Don't let it go to your head, kid, said Dempsey. I won't, and stop calling me kid. Dempsey only nodded again. Kid's going to be a good one, he thought. And that's the end of The Case of the Carriageless Horse by Stephen M. Moore, appearing in World Enough and Crime, an anthology by Carrick Publishing, produced in 2014. Let it rot. Thank you for listening to The Case of the Carriageless Horse. And now for our first giveaway. We have contests that appear at our Facebook page, Dead to Rights, so all you need to do is visit the Dead to Rights Facebook page, like it, and look for this week's questions about our podcast. And this question relates to the characters in The Case of the Carriageless Horse. I'm going to ask you, what is Detective Castelblanco's first name? And my hint for you is, his name is Rolando. Here we are, Season 1, Episode 3 of Dead to Rights, The Case of the Carriageless Horse. And today we're pleased to bring to you Stephen M. Moore, author of sci-fi, mysteries, thrillers, short stories, and book reviews. At last count, Stephen has written dozens of books, including one novel for young adults. He also has two short story collections. His stories reflect his keen interest in the diversity of human nature that he has observed in his different abodes across the U.S. and in South America, as well as in his European travels for both work and pleasure. Stephen's interests include physics, mathematics, forensics, genetics, robotics, and scientific ethics. He also has an active blog where he comments on current events and their meaning to the U.S. and the rest of the world, and posts opinions about writing and the publishing business from the perspective of an indie author. Steve and his wife now live just outside of New York City, and his website is stephenmmoore.com, so you can find him there. Now, without further ado, we bring you Stephen Moore. Oh, 
Hi, Stephen. It's Donna. How are you? Oh, I'm good. How about you? I'm great. Welcome to Dead to Rights. Good morning to you, and I'm and, and, um, happy to be talking with you. <laughs> Thank you very much for agreeing to an interview. I had a few questions for you this morning that I wanted to get to. Um, as you know, I read your story, The Case of the Carriageless Horse, for our readers today, and uh, it brought oh, me back yeah. to the great characters, the early days of Detectives Chin and Castelblanco, who are among my favorites of your characters. Um, who are a few of your favorite authors, especially those that might have influenced your writing? Well, there's a lot of them, of course. Uh, I, I, I'm a bit old-fashioned I, because I, be, I began to think about storytelling as a kid. Um, I'd have to say at the top of my list is Asimov. And, you know, people know him uh, for his sci-fi, of course, and also his popular science books. But, yes, 2001. Uh, yeah, but uh, two of his sci-fi novels are also mysteries. Uh, he was a great fan of mysteries, and uh, so yeah, I'm sort of, uh, you know, he's sort of my uh, hero in that sense of, you know, being a fan of mysteries and thrillers, and uh, of course back in his day, I don't think they called them thrillers, and uh, sci-fi, so... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I love cross-genre works. I, I think we're doing away with the stereotypical genres uh, of books anyway, aren't we? Everything is becoming yeah, kind of cross-genre. So. I, I, I see them more as just categories that, uh, uh, key words you can use to describe books now. Exactly. Uh, what motivates your writing when you get up in the morning? What makes you want to sit down with your computer and, and start churning out words? Uh, well, I've always loved to tell a good story. <laughs> <laughs> and you do, and you do. You do it very yeah, well. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's the old Irish in me, you know, the, the Blarney or whatever, you know. It's, it, it's just when I was a kid and I was reading all these stories, I said, well, I can do that. Maybe mm -hmm. not as good, uh, of course, but I, and I said to myself, I can do that, and I want to do that. Well, I postponed it a little bit, but, uh, you know, I got back to it. Yeah, it's a little bit of the Irish, too, isn't it? I, 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 I remember reading some when I was a kid and thinking, I love titles. I fell in love with titles, and, and that was a big motivator for me, it, which leads yeah, me... Yeah, me, too. You know, it's funny you mention that. Uh, I don't think writers pay enough attention to their titles, and, uh, you know, I, I really uh, sweat my titles, as, as uh, would be a profane way of saying it, uh, because, uh, you know, I generally have like a half dozen or so at least uh, yes. before I decide on a final title. It's, it, it's a, it, it always attracted me when I was a kid, too. Same here. I mean, the title's got to be per perfect. I'll often have a working title, and about midway through writing a piece, something will trigger, okay, this is the perfect title right here. Or sometimes Alec will throw ideas out at me, too, and we'll just sit and band that back and forth some uh, title ideas until we come up with the perfect one. Oh, that's good. That's good. See, I, I have to have that discussion internally. Uh, but uh, well, I, I think that that my wife has come up with some good titles. So yeah. So where else would you look for ideas? Uh, well, it, to summarize it uh, in one word, globe trotting probably is, uh, has has uh, led me to uh, a, a lot of you know to understand and observe a, a lot of interesting cultures. And well, that actually poems. leads to my, my question that I had next on my list for you, that as a native Californian, you've traveled a great deal. And do these experiences find their way into their work? And I know the answer to that, but if you could answer it for our listeners. And in what way do they find their way into your fiction? Well, uh, I, think that, <laughs> I think they find my way into fiction not only in the uh, mysteries and thrillers but also into the sci-fi and uh, uh, like I said it travels for work and pleasure uh, uh, just I, I was lucky enough to do that and uh, uh, it allowed me to observe a lot of things around the world that uh, you know I, I, I guess other people don't get a chance to do and that filters into my writing and, and I hopefully makes it uh, more uh, I don't know, more universal in some sense. I think so. I think the more we um, the more we know about the world, the more we do recognize the similarities. And when you get off world with your characters, you take those same those same aspects of humanity with you, I think. And uh, I think yeah. you do that very well in your work and your travel shows. Well, I've I've gotten gotten, you know, 
know, you have Google Earth and all that stuff. So I, I challenge you, you know, readers to figure out the places where I've actually been and the places where where I'm, you know, just doing uh, what's called research, you know, for my book. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, but you know, it, that's a great uh, challenge. I wonder how a reader would be able to tell. Um, I think if the research is done well enough, it might be difficult, but. When well, you have a real a experience, to, uh, uh, to visit a lot of places that I haven't been to. So. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yes. Um, the other thing about your background that a lot of people might not know is your scientific re- research and development in your career, and uh, I'm wondering how does it inform your characters or the situations in your fiction? Well, um, I, I think you. Uh, I think it affects more my focus and my uh, sticking to a, to, a, to a story and getting it done. I mean, when, when you when you're, uh, have to organize and lead scientific R&D efforts, you, uh, you develop a sort of a, a logical mentality to, to lay things out and get things done in an orderly fashion. And uh, that's probably the number one influence. But, uh, you know, I've met a lot of interesting characters while while working in R and D, so uh, some bet. of that gets in, into my characters, and uh, but you know I've met a lot of other characters outside of the R and D world too. So I wasn't even thinking about characters, but that that's great because yeah, you, we all draw on people that we know, or at least aspects of them. Of course, our our international disclaimer is that this is not based on any individual character, but the truth is most characters are a composite of people that we've met um, exactly. in some way or another. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all going to make, you know, like a, a mixture of uh, metals to make something very, very more profound and, and more general or something. Yes, yes, a composite, yeah. Um, yeah. What I was really thinking about with the scientific background is when you get into your um, sci-fi thrillers, do you use any of your scientific knowledge in that way? Uh, some, uh, I've had to, I mean, I, I was fairly specialized, uh, uh, in, in the R and D I was doing. So I have used, uh, a publication that Asimov, in fact, uh, actually used too. It's called Science News. And that keeps me up on the whole, uh, range of science. So, you know, when I, when I wrote the book Full Medical, I was already familiar with some of the ideas about cloning and all that from from science news. So, you know, I I'm no expert on cloning, but you know, I, I have enough of that science and technology in the book that it, it seems very real. I was gonna I was gonna touch on full medical, and for the sake of our listeners, I, I suggest you go to Amazon or your favorite retailer, Barnes and Nobles, or any of them. I I don't push Amazon for sure, but look up Full Medical by Stephen M. Moore. I think that you'll really enjoy that one. Well, that was actually the first book I, I published, and uh, you you were kind enough to uh, do a second edition of it, which I think uh, you know improved uh, over the first. I've been doing this too long, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been doing it a long time, that's for sure. I, in in my yeah. intro before we connected, I was telling people how many books you had under your belt, and I think I may have I may have underplayed the number of books because I think since my last reading on your bio, I think you've actually got more. How how many novels have you published at this point? I don't know. There's, there's, there's something like two dozen. I, 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 I stopped counting really. Because, I said uh, twenty three, and I think maybe that's where I stopped counting. So yeah, you're probably yeah. right. It probably is twenty four, as well as a couple of collections of short stories too. And I, I particularly yeah. like the the collection of short stories. Um, tell me the title. It's uh, Paso Dobles. Tell me the full title of that one. Paso Dobles in a Quantum Stringscape. Thank you. That's, that's, that's a title I really sweated over, by the way. <laughs> and that is a fantastic collection of short stories by Stephen M. Moore, so please look that up. I enjoyed every one of those. Yeah, it's, it, it's uh, you know, Margaret Atwood uh, like to, she likes to use the phrase speculative fiction to include science fiction and horror and paranormal and all this stuff. And there, that mix is in that book. Yes. Uh, I, I, I love short story writing. It's just that... Uh, I, I don't see them selling very well. No, uh, neither do I, uh, to be honest. I think we write short stories for love, 
and we write novels yeah. to really reach yeah. readers. But um, this is why I, I really wanted to get into this podcasting, because I think that people do like short stories. They just don't want to buy them. That's my theory. Yeah. And so what I've come to see in today's publishing world and in today's writing uh, industry is that short stories are an introduction to a reader. Um, at one time, maybe that wasn't true, but I think that is true more than anything now. And so what I'm hoping to do with the podcast is bring readers to these short stories and get them to know the authors so that they can look into their novels and see what, what, um, what triggers their desire to read. Yes, I, 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 I agree with you on, uh, on them being an introduction to uh, an author's writing. I've gone probably to the extremes on, on, in that sense because uh, I give, uh, um, I, I write a lot of short stories for my blog and, and I also uh, have a PDF free for the asking that contain uh, short stories and novellas. I mean, I, I can't publish everything and, and I do love to write short fiction. Yes. Uh, I know most of our authors have got short stories, even if they haven't published them, they've written them. So there's something there. There's something that we're working out as writers when we do a short story. We're getting to know our characters better. And from a reader's perspective, I think they can get to know us better. They, you know, they can lift back the veil and say, that's who this writer is. And that's what this writer is trying to accomplish, you know? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's an evolution, you know, that a lot of things are changing in publishing and it's an evolution that's going on. But uh, We're blessed and know, cursed to be in the crux of it, aren't we? We're both blessed yeah, and cursed. Yeah, yeah, we seem to be at, the, at, at a crossroads, actually. One day they'll uh, call and, us the pioneers, and, uh, all, Stephen. All these things are, are going to shake out, I guess, in the future, and I, I don't know. But, you know, the, the key thing here is storytelling. I think storytelling is a very necessary human element, uh, uh, very important to the human experience. And if we lose that, we're, we're going to be less human. Yes. And you know what? Absolutely every author I've spoken with has made exactly that same point. Isn't that interesting? I, I, I said to Joan a uh, couple of weeks ago that I think that um, when we listen to and tell stories, we become more empathetic because we, we acquire greater understanding of the similarities between people. And um, I think that is so vital to humanity, especially in times like these. But not getting off into that whole, that whole arena, um, I'm going to ask you about Chen and Castelblanco and also Joe. Joe. Joe from uh, Virginia Morgan, the um, Golden Years of Virginia. Oh no, I mean Ashley Scott. She was she was actually the main character in Virginia Morgan. Virginia Morgan was the FBI agent that was forced to retire, shall we say? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now Ashley Scott had worked with uh, Chin and Castablanco on several cases in my detective series, and um, you know your t characters and your muses, for that matter, start getting after you. And Ashley wanted her her own novel, and that's 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 where the uh, uh, golden years of Virginia Morgan came from. And that's just a beautiful book um, with a gorgeous cover by Sarah Carrick. Let me give Sarah a little plug there, because yes, yes, of all fact, the covers uh, she's done, uh, I do I think... I have to say that 100% uh, 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 of my beautiful covers are, are, are hers, <laughs> of them all, I, I, I kind of think that's my favorite. I don't know whether she would agree or not, but I love the oh, cover yeah, of The Golden it's very Years. appropriate, very, very telling uh, of what, what the story's about. Yes, yes. Um, now, many of your characters are female, and one of the things yes. I've noticed as I read your work is that you've got a very good method for getting into... Well, maybe maybe you don't even draw a distinction. I shouldn't put words in your mouth. But for some reason, you seem able to tap into the emotions and the logic that women use when they're going through the motions of different situations. So tell me a little bit about that, how you got that understanding. Well, I've, I've known a lot of very uh, uh, smart and determined women in my life. Uh, uh, I've uh, been married uh, to two actually uh, my, my my first wife passed away in a in a car accident and my second wife uh, is is 
uh, all Irish, and uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> they sort of taught me, uh, if you want to say it, say it that way, uh, that there there is no distinction. Uh, they, they 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 deserve. I mean, they they basically represent fifty percent of the human race, and they, exactly, they started, I think it's fifty two. Started in fact. appreciating them, right? Yeah, and uh, I've known. Uh, uh, quite a few in my life. I've also known quite a few, and and uh, that have suffered uh, harassment and the exploitation, and uh, that's all too pre- prevalent. Uh, so um, I, I saw quite a bit of it in science and engineering environment, and I saw quite a bit of it when I was living in Colombia. And um, as a, as a professor, when I was a professor, I resented any parent who affirmed uh, that. Her or his daughter couldn't be a scientist, mathematician, or engineering because women can't do that. They would say, mm-hmm. and uh, my answer was, "Oh yes, they can." And uh, yet, women. So, yeah. You yeah. know, I, 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 I guess your your first uh, take is is correct. I, I, I don't make any distinct distinction. We're all human beings. We're 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 going after the same thing, and uh, uh, it, it, it's lovely that uh, uh, you know we have. Two versions that uh, can work together to go go after those things. So, exactly, I mean, and where I, there may be differences, we don't know whether they're nature or nurture, and it hardly matters. Where there are differences, yes. I think we complement each other, and I think that um, honestly, we all strive just to persevere in this life, and we all want to be the best selves we can be. Not everyone has a handle on how to do that, but for those who strive and struggle, I think it's. It's just critical. It's really critical to support rather than put the thumb down on, you know. And when I hear people oh, say yes. things like women and minorities, I don't Are even know what that means, that catch-all yes. phrase. We are all human beings, every single one of us. And yes, even yes. even the word minority is a misnomer because amongst the world, when you look at the actual stats... Um, what we refer to commonly in the Western world as minorities is ridiculous. Yes. It, it doesn't measure up in numbers, you know? Yes. Uh, well, and, and uh, you know, from the sci-fi point of view, or, or maybe the astronauts at the International Space Station, the, the, we're, we're all on the spaceship together, and, uh, you know, that's let's right. make the most of it. That's right, and that was what caught the appeal in the early days of sci-fi. Sci-fi goes back such a long way, but um, my husband was telling me the story about how uh, Lucille Ball actually was the one who was brave enough to back Star Trek. And look at the entire industry that's come out of Star Trek, and we're big Star Trek fans in this family. And the whole ideal that we go together in this piece of tin from world to world, representing humanity, and our differences do not supersede our similarities. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of those, especially the original Star Trek, were uh, they were morality plays. They and, were. Uh, and uh, I'll have to put in a plug for the authors because a lot of the authors of those plays were science, real science fiction writers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the later Star Trek tend to be more screenwriters, and yes, you know, sometimes the plots don't hang together as they should in a. No, I mean, and they, they have a lot of great the special ones effects. are really taken from short stories, and the, the plots hang hung together very well. Yes, yes, they did. That's right. I love them all for different reasons. Like uh, the newer ones, I agree with you. They're not as plot cohesive. But they're still great fun, and the characters are just absolutely wonderful. So that, that's my plug for Star Trek today. But I've got to ask you one more question, Steve, before I can let you go, because I've promised our listeners that I would ask every author for tips. And I'm not going to guide you on this one. Any tip you can give to new writers from any aspect of the industry? Okay, well... Um... I guess I'd rather ha- uh, quote uh, first uh, two other writers that maybe people don't know. This is a first quote is from Cyril, Cyril uh, Connolly. Um, he says, better to write for yourself and have no public than write for the public and have no self. Yes. I think that's a good uh, thing to follow for new writers. Yes. And then one of my old 
English professors has a great quote that uh, I, I, I find quite helpful in my writing. I simply kept my goal in mind and persisted. Perseverance is a large part of writing. And that's from, uh, he's a Pulitzer Prize winner, M. Scott Mamadi. He's a Native American. And um, he, uh, he definitely uh, offers a piece of good advice there. That, that's terrific. I think both of those, uh, perseverance, absolutely. Sit down and write, and um, uh, and writing for but, yourself. You know, the, the publishing process is simple. You, you, you first write a good story. That's the first thing to do. And then I, I, I think uh, what I would advise uh, uh, new writers to do is don't pretend that you can, uh, you know all, everything that you need to know to to make that story public. It, 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 it's, it's good to get some uh, professional help, you know, editing, formatting, cover artist, yes. PR and marketing. Those are all things that most writers know nothing about. Uh, they, they, they should, you know, even when you're doing uh, indie uh, work. Uh, you Especially should, uh, when you're doing indie work, because um, as you know, Steve, I'm a huge proponent of let's not malign indie work. Indie work is the way of the future. I firmly believe that. We'll always have big money backers who will back the biggest of the big in our industry. That will always exist. But for the rest of us, indie is the way of today and it's the way of the future and I don't want to malign indie work I want indie work to get better and better and better and to do that it's exactly what you said know what your own limitations as an author are and get help get help yes, just like you would if you had a money back 100 percent DIY now in the indie world I mean there's 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 too much stuff that uh, you know my father was an artist but I, I, I'm, I'm a klutz as far as art goes Mm -hmm. Although I appreciate it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know, uh, Sarah, Sarah comes to mind. You know, there's people out there who know uh, how to make a cover far better than I do. Yes, and far um, better than I do too. <laughs> yeah, and quite thing, true. You know, I, an author is, is is not a marketer, right? And uh, uh, there, there, there's all kinds of levels of, of marketing that. Uh, some are even free that uh, that professionals do, and uh, the the author should let them do it. Exactly. Can you name one that that you found effective? Or I won't put oh, you on yeah, the spot. I, I I work with uh, oh boy the the name. Uh, anyway, I know the uh, outfit. It's called Book Buzz. Yes, yes, Book I've Buzz. heard of them. Yeah. Uh, Amanda. Uh, she's she's done a lot of uh, uh, launch marketing for me. In fact. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, she's been been a constant in my publishing life. Um, but they're they're all levels, and uh, you know, there's places like Just Kindle and all that where uh, the author himself can uh, type in some information and and get get some marketing help uh, for a very low cost. So uh, I, I don't want to really push any any specific uh, organization here, but. It, it, but it's helpful. It's helpful let, for let writers. Even, do it. Yeah, it's helpful for new writers because when they first come into our industry, they don't know anything or anyone. So it's really it's not about pushing a particular brand, but it's just about throwing a few names out that they can research for themselves and see whether it's something that they want to do, and it may lead yes. them to yet other names that that they find are a better fit for them. It's just about yes. where do I start when they're new? You know, where do I start? Yes. And um, I want to thank you for coming on Dead to Rights, the podcast today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It was wonderful. It was great to finally hear your voice. We've, we've chatted so much online over the years, and now I finally yeah. hear your voice. You've got a great voice. Well, thank you. So are you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enjoy your weekend, Steve. Thank you very much. Okay, you take care. And now it's time for you to join us at our Dead to Rights Facebook page for our final giveaway contest. 
And the contest this week for the copy of World Enough and Crime, which features Stephen Moore's story, The Case of the Carriageless Horse, is to answer the question, what is Stephen's tip for writers? And he actually had two tips for us today. He advised us that perseverance is critical for a writer, and he also said that it's important to write for yourself rather than for your public, because that's where the gold is. So if you'll join us at our Facebook page and answer with one of those answers, then I will send you a copy of World Enough and Crime, which features Stephen's story, The Case of the Carriageless Horse. Thank you very much for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed our episode three of Dead to Rights, the podcast, and we hope to see you again next week. Dusty road, a man alone. His vital signs go on hold. And I don't know what you've been told. But the years have turned my eyes gold. And I told you what you told me. We'd never be in the same boat for free, yet it rides, let it ride.